Well, maybe you can get into telling us exactly what some of those cases that you guys have really filed and dealt with are. Are they, you know, just cases where there's a, are they more sort of um, individual cases or do you guys do like group litigation? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. We do both parts. And I think one of the best ways that I can help people understand what we do a little bit better is by actually just telling a story about uh, one of our clients. And one of the best people to talk about is a gentleman by the name of Francisco Molina, who actually is in right, right in my backyard in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And he had a little bit of a unique situation come up uh, back a little over a year ago now, um, where he was, you know, what, let me start with this. Francisco Molina has been involved in his union for 14 years. So this isn't uh, a situation in which he's been frustrated by the union or anything. He really was one of the guys who got involved because he thought that he could change things from within. And about a year ago, he started into a union meeting and the representatives at the front of that meeting actually handed out new membership cards. And they're saying, hey, the old cards, they're no longer valid. We need you to sign these. And they were preparing for some of the changing legal landscape, which we can talk about as well. Um, but what he did, most people were signing the cards and they're handing them back in. And Cisco, he's a very, very smart guy. And he sat there and he actually read the fine print. So he read what was going on. And what he found out was this card, had he signed it, it would have required him to pay dues to the union, regardless of his membership regardless of whether or not he was working in that position, uh, regardless of whether or not he was even employed by Lehigh County, uh, which is where he was working for the Department of Children and Youth. So, uh, you know, he raised his hand and he said, I'm not going to sign this at all. Uh, this isn't going to happen. This is completely wrong. And I think where a lot of people would have just stopped and said, all right, hey, I'm not going to sign it. Cisco uh, got a little loud. Uh, he, he spoke at commissioners meetings. He started talking to his coworkers, informing them, just encouraging them to read the card and make the decision for themselves because uh, he didn't feel like it was right for him, but he didn't feel like it was transparent and clear. And, and the result was uh, just about two weeks after he spoke up at the commissioners meeting, uh, he lost his job. So he was stuck between a rock and a hard place. And, you know, luckily he landed on his feet. Um, but his lawsuit is directly challenging, uh, not just the treatment, but also making sure that the, the details about transparency and, and his union membership are cleared up. Um, so it, it really interesting situation there. But if it's all right with you, I think one of the good context pieces that people should understand is, is a pretty major lawsuit at the Supreme Court called Janus. Is that something that your listeners Absolutely. have heard before? So some of our listeners may have heard of it, but I was going to ask if you could elaborate a bit on that. I know uh, Janus was a case that the Supreme Court settled in 2018, but it really kind of changed the whole landscape for dealing with unions, specifically public unions. Maybe you could tell our listeners more about that. Yeah. So, so the Janus versus AFSCME decision was really just asking a very simple question, very simple issue. And that is, do you have to pay money to a public sector union as a condition of employment? Uh, previously, you had to pay fees. Even if you were a non-member, you still had to pay money to the union regardless. And the issue was surprisingly <laughs> contentious, and it worked its way up from the local level all the way to the Supreme Court. And what the Supreme Court said was, actually, you know what? In fact, you should not have to pay money to a public sector union as a condition of employment. Um, and I think there's a, there's a really interesting point there, which is Mark Janis lived in Illinois. And so when that decision came down, it was, I guess, to the layman, the way I interpreted it initially was, all right, hey, this is great, right? This issue is solved. Uh, but as our legal team informed me, when a Supreme Court decision comes down, it doesn't impact the whole country. It still needs to be implemented in all these other states. And, and that's really what the last year has been since the summer of 2018, where this decision came down, is trying to figure out in Pennsylvania and Connecticut, and really in lawsuits across the country, how do public sector employees get their rights? So Francisco Molina, when he heard about that case, you know, that's when he started speaking up. That's when he resigned his own union membership 
And that's what's happened in this last year. People have been challenging this decision to find out what are those nuances and what does it actually mean at the local level. So has your, uh, has your organization really been dealing with kind of trying to extricate those individuals from those organizations? Because in a lot of ways, I know the argument for why they had you know, fees in the first place is essentially trying to avoid a free rider problem. So if you have individuals who are working at a job where there is a union who has negotiated certain um, employment agreements or even just wages, is that something where we might see people um, in negotiating like individual contracts or will they still have an ability to benefit from that even though they're not taking part in the union? Right. Well, I think you hit on exactly the right thing. And, and what I'm pulling out of that is that the core message of this is about fairness and it's about choice. And at the end of the day, you know, we talk about lawsuits just generally in the abstract. And I think one of the things that we need to remember is that, I mean, these are real people with families who are part of communities. And so when we look at union membership at the Fairness Center, what we would say is absolutely, if you would like to be part of a union, go ahead. That is your, that's your right, that's your choice, it's an important thing, and it's a very intensely personal decision. But let's be fair about it. On the other side of that, there are people who are gonna make decisions for their own families and for their own communities and for themselves that say, you know what, union membership is not right for me. And to say that one person's rights are more valuable than the other in that situation, that's really where the rub, rub becomes a problem and where these lawsuits come out of. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Litigating these issues is about trying to find the balance and make sure that everyone's rights are being respected to the letter of the law, which Janice very clearly stated, you don't have to pay. So let's make sure that that's actually the case when it gets down to these communities and these local unions. So in Mr. Molina's case, is this, uh, is he able to at least stop paying or is this something where they, it's actually like proactively taken out of your check? I mean, I know not paying your taxes is a lot more difficult than just deciding not to. Is it right. kind of a similar thing? So when you work in these bargaining units, if you're part of a bargaining unit, the dues are extracted prior to uh, you ever getting that money in your bank account. Uh, but the situation with Mr. Molina specifically is a little bit different because he refused to sign that card. So when he refused to sign that card, it actually prevented the union from accessing his money. When he, when he left that job, they're no longer able to extract money. So the good news about his situation is he's not having money actively taken out of his bank account right now. But the unfortunate part is that for months and months between that card not being signed and him being dismissed from his position, he continued to have money taken out of his paycheck against his will. And I want to talk about something really important here, which is the way that, that this kind of dynamic can impact people's lives. I mean, Cisco has a family and, and his job as his official position was a case aid three for Lehigh County Children and Youth Department. And what that means is he was a transport driver and the primary Spanish interpreter for the county. So he would go and rescue kids from damaged homes. And this was a very personal thing for him. Uh, he says this publicly, so I feel comfortable sharing it, but he grew up in an abusive household. Uh, he grew up in a place where he was not able to escape or have these resources quite as easily. So he loved that job so much. And it, it meant something to him here. Just as a, as a person, he was giving back in a way that in, in a way that he was never able to receive himself. So losing this job was incredibly damaging. But when he ran into this problem, he started to speak out. And he got pushback from the union. Uh, you know, he was getting in his words, harassed at work, he was getting treated unfairly. And that's part of this as well is the ability to, to raise your voice and speak up for your rights is so important. And in a lot of these situations, it, even if in, by the letter of the law, it's being protected, we need to make sure that people have the, the support, yes, in the court of law, but also in the support in, in the court of public opinion to make sure that their, their viewpoints are being respected. Well, it's, I'm glad that we have an organization like the Fairness Center that's representing individuals like that. But it's just important. It, you know, you, you mentioned that um, you, there are individual cases like this, but you also mentioned groups. 
I, you know, are there any situations where there are um, groups that you may represent who are, you know, part of a bigger union? I know sometimes you have uh, teachers. I mean, in fact, the Janus case um, originally involved a union which is part of a bigger union. Uh, yep. Do you guys have any cases dealing with issues at that level? Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you say that because not only do we represent large groups of people, but we actually represent all manner of groups. So it's not just limited to individuals in that way. Uh, one of the best examples of that is we actually represent a group of firefighters. And that group is not just uh, by coincidence named Local 825. We absolutely actually represent a local union who has been hurt by their state union. Uh, so it gets a little complicated, but I think getting back to what our mission is, is to protect those who have been hurt by public sector union officials. That isn't necessarily just the odd guy here or there. In this case, we're talking about the entirety of 360 odd firefighters in local 825 New Haven, Connecticut, uh, who, who were very seriously injured by their state union, the UPFFA. And I could talk a little bit about kind of the background of that if you're interested. It's well, absolutely. I'm very curious. How, how, does, how does a union hurt another union? Right. <laughs> it is. It's a, it's a kind of a funny situation because you don't really hear about it that often because uh, unions generally tend to be pretty good at handling this stuff internally, right? It's yeah, very so rare that this makes it to the, to the public. It's all eye. about coming together, right? Exactly. Right. Well, well, the whole idea of solidarity and, and you know, working together and doing this, and it's such an important thing because in the local union that we represent, the executive board who, who is in charge of this, this local organization, these guys just work day in and day out to provide the best representation they can for these firefighters. And what happens is unions are organized in a variety of ways, but in this case, there's a local union, there's a state union, and there's an international union. So there's multiple layers of unions here. And about two and a half years ago now, the local union got a new executive board and they were taking a look at their books and they were not financially healthy and they were looking for ways to cut. And through that process, they realized they were paying a tremendous amount of money to the state union and they weren't really getting the value that they wanted from them. So they took a vote. It was unanimous. The executive board voted to leave the state union. And they sent in the letter and said, hey, yes, we're going to leave. It was unanimous. Thank you. It's been great. But, you know, we're going to sever ties. And sure, that all sounds well and good. But the problem was two years later, the state union had continued to refuse to acknowledge their disaffiliation. They said, mm -hmm. nope, you cannot leave. We're not going to allow you to. And it got so bad. This is all before the Fairness Center was contacted. It got so bad that the local department had been put into collections by the state union. They, they, firefighters' parents were being called in their homes saying that their children, these firefighters, were going to be thrown in jail if these dues were not paid. It, there was a tremendous amount of not solidarity going on, right? There was a whole lot of headbutting. Uh, and that's why uh, that local fire department reached out to us. And yeah, it's a unique situation. But again, it gets back to that choice. If you want to be part of an organization, absolutely, you should have the right to do so. Uh, but if you don't, or you don't feel like you're getting the type of representation that you need, want, deserve, heck yes, you should be able to say, no, thank you. It's been great, but we're going to move on. Or we're not going to become members in the first place. Uh, what has been great about this situation uh, with Local 825 is the courts have agreed with us. In fact, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to get an injunction in court. It's just legally, it's a very tough thing to achieve. Uh, but we actually had a, a judge, we won an injunction, and he officially recognized that Local 825 had disaffiliated from the state union, which was just a massive win. It was, it's so powerful to see these firefighters walking around with big smiles on their faces, recognizing that, hey, yes, uh, you know, courts backed us up. We did the right thing and our rights are going to be respected. Uh, and that's really what we want for all of our clients is for them to, at the end of the day, know that they have the support and that the judicial system and, and their union is going to treat them right. Yeah, I mean, it really, it's really just a matter of, of respecting consent. I mean, it's really sad that in that case, you literally have to have years of litigation yep. and a judge to say, oh, yeah, we can recognize that you revoked your consent. Yeah, 
Yeah. And it, I mean, it happens all over the place. And one of the things that we found is a lot of times when people reach out to us, they already have a problem, right? They're already so far down the road and they don't know where to turn. Uh, in some of our cases, we've had people who have already retained other attorneys for huge amounts of money. You know, attorneys are expensive. It could be right, 500 bucks an hour sometimes. And when we're talking about protecting teachers, nurses, firefighters, these guys don't have the funds to be throwing around 20, 30, $40,000 in a year to fight something that, you know, it's a, it's an argument of principle. It's not necessarily arguing over hundreds and thousands or millions of dollars. This is just normal people asking for their rights to be respected. So it's really, I mean, that's why we exist as a nonprofit is because when people come to us because they've been hurt, we represent them 100% for free, not a penny out of their pocket. Uh, which is, it's a great feeling for, for us and it's a great feeling for them. Well, how exactly are you guys able to do that? Where is, you know, where, where is the basis coming from for that kind of support? Yeah, so we're 501c3 uh, as a nonprofit. So we're 100% donor supported. So there are, uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of people from across the country who send money because they support our mission. Uh, and that's really the best thing about it is because our mission is so simple and straightforward, protect those who have been hurt by public sector union officials. People voluntarily give to us because they believe in that mission and they believe that people's rights ought to be respected. And if some of our listeners wanted to give, where would they go to do that? Well, you know, if you wanted to, A, learn more about our organization, learn about our clients, of course, if you'd like to donate and support our work, the best place to do that is online, uh, www.fairnesscenter.com. Dot .org. Uh, I think, yes, it's a great place to just get information, but I, I don't want to scare people away by thinking it's all legalese and <laughs> that it's not exciting. We have a ton of video content on there. And most importantly, we have video content of our clients telling their stories, which is just, it's, it's, a, it's very powerful, even for me who lives with these every single day uh, to see these stories and hear these stories. And I absolutely encourage people to go online and check those out at fairnesscenter.org. So the Fairness Center has been around since before the Janus case. I was looking into, it's been founded in uh, 2014. I'm not sure how Correct. long you've been with the organization, but how much has the Janus case really like shifted the focus of the litigation you guys are dealing with or even just the kind of cases? Yeah. So it's interesting. A lot of the uh, Janus decision um, questions were also pre-existing. So we actually had cases, uh, the case called Hartnett uh, versus PSEA, and we actually were racing Janice up to the Supreme Court, and they happened to get there first. Uh, but we had a bunch of cases that were stayed pending that decision. So right now, post Janice, uh, all of those kind of backlogged cases, I you know, Janice was kind of took the cork out of the bottle, and now we got to pour everything out into the mm -hmm. judicial system and see where it, where it settles. Uh, so all of those are still being worked out. Uh, but post Janice, there's also been some interesting questions that have come up where Janice asked about the rights of non-members, so these previous fee payers, a lot of the questions now are starting to question, what are the rights of members? So for example, uh, do you have to be a part of a union? Do you have to pay these organizations? All of these questions are starting to come out, and, and one of them is something called maintenance of membership. And I'm going to be really basic about this because I don't want to be dry and legal and boring. And because I'm not an attorney, uh, I like to be able to bring a little bit more personality to it. But imagine that you could only exercise your constitutional rights for a narrow 15-day window every three to five years. That sounds kind of crazy. But that's exactly what's happening right now with people's ability to access their Janus rights. So these public employees, if they want to access their Janus rights and not pay a union, what the union is saying is you actually are forced to be a member by contractual uh, language for the entirety of a contract, which can be three to five years, and you only have a very narrow escape window, 15 days at the end of that contract, in which you need to send in certified letters, connect with people, you need to do all the right things. And if, God forbid, if you miss it in that 15 day window, you're then locked in for another three to five years. Uh, so By these, default. These, exactly, yeah, and right, it's written into the language, it's legal and a lot of states still have this. It's one of the things that, 
that exists in Pennsylvania and why there are so many lawsuits. I mean, maintenance of membership, we filed uh, seven lawsuits on maintenance of membership just in the last eight months, uh, just on this one question. Um, so anyone who's experiencing these problems, we so often get people when they're already so far down the path. Uh, we would love to make sure that people's constitutional rights are protected all the time. And, and those are the kind of questions that we're looking at is, can we do the right thing? Can we do it earlier? And can we get these questions answered before people are seriously hurt or damaged or feel like they're all alone on an island in their workplace uh, worrying about their rights? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question of that, that kind of dichotomy of opt-in versus, versus opt-out. Um, you know, it, it gets to a, a lot of policy uh, concepts where the, the idea of, well, you have a freedom here because you're, you're given the option to opt out, but by default, we're going to go ahead and, and decide we know what's best. I, right. think, uh, I think I've actually heard that referred to as libertarian paternalism before. Right. <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, that's, so yeah, that's it's an interesting, it's an interesting situation. And unfortunately, yes, we work right now uh, as a state focused organization in Pennsylvania and Connecticut. Uh, but these are, these are situations that are occurring all across the country. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a real shame uh, to think that, just because you you decided to be a public servant or you decided you want to be a teacher, that you should waive your constitutional rights, it doesn't add up. And that's something that, that needs to be addressed sooner rather than later to protect these people. How does the Fairness Center go about finding these kinds of clients? Do you wait for people to reach out to you or do you kind of go out actively seeking these kinds of cases? You know, to hear our legal team describe it, I think lawyers generally uh, have some guardrails about their ability to, you know, go out and market. Mm -hmm. um, so those are something that our legal team handles. Uh, but by and large, we have referrals uh, from, from different people. A lot of our clients will say, hey, you know, I, I've seen this issue occurring somewhere else. Uh, but by and large, we get legal inquiries uh, frequently. Uh, I believe the number that was told to me was post Janus. So summer of 2018, uh, our legal inquiries increased 400% because people were actually understanding that they might be in a situation where their rights are being violated. And a lot of this is about information, right? It's about people understanding their yeah. rights. And that's something that just, it's not a common area of law. So a lot of what we do is exactly stuff like this. My job is to tell our clients stories. So when I come out, my hope is that people will have a little bit better of an understanding about what their rights are and what their neighbor's rights are, what their family member's rights are, so that if they do run into a situation, they can say, oh, hey, I got a guy for this. I can help out and, and we can make a difference. Or, you know, ideally in an even better situation, we might be able to get to a point where people can assert, hey, I know that this is a right that I have and that you don't necessarily have to go through, you know, getting a lawyer and everything first because it's, it's not cheap for anybody, even if you do have a 501c3 willing to back you. Yeah. Well, even then, right? Just the time commitment. Uh, people's awareness and notification of their rights is so important. Uh, and unfortunately, our public employees don't always have that luxury because uh, the information's A, very technical, and B, it can be very difficult to find. Um, that's just the reality of the world we live in right now, but hopefully that can change in the future. So what kinds of things are the Fairness Center hoping to be able to attack in the future? Maybe once we've gotten some of these Janus questions sorted out, is there anything else that's on the horizon? You know, I think that, man, that would be a fantastic question for our legal team. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that I do is I spend so much time dealing with our existing clients that the novel legal questions um, are not necessarily on my radar. Uh, but one of the best places that you can uh, go to kind of see that thought process unfolds, because as our lawyers have described to me, it is kind of a, it's a little bit of a gray area about what comes next, because as these questions are settled, the courts will either open new doors or close others. Um, but we do blog uh, on our website, um, and that's one of the best places where our attorneys kind of lay out some of these interesting questions or other things that are upcoming. So again, on fairnesscenter.org is a great place. Uh, our president, David Osborne, our vice president, Nathan McGrath, uh, put out content kind of asking these questions and uh, as both very relatable, easy to read uh, type of folks. Uh, it's really great content uh, for anybody who's interested to kind of subscribe and follow and get that stuff right in their inbox about what these rights could look like in the next couple of years. Well, that's very exciting. And I'm sure we'll see great things to come. Fingers crossed. <laughs>
Well, Connor, is there anywhere that you can tell our listeners about how they could find you or anything else that you might be interested in um, coming on and talking about later? Yeah, I'd say the best place that you can go is go straight to fairnesscenter.org. As I said, just the engagement piece and getting to know our clients a little bit. Um, you know, to hear me say it is is great, and I'm sure you're all on the edge of your seats. But really, to hear these folks tell their stories is incredibly powerful. Uh, and on fairnesscenter.org, we have these videos, we have these stories, uh, and I'd encourage you all to go and check those out and uh, learn a little bit more about what we do. Well, thank you for coming on and talking with us today. Thanks and if so you much have, for having me. And if you have enjoyed this episode of We Are Libertarians, be sure to check out our Patreon. Um, everything that we do here takes support of you wonderful listeners, and we love you guys every day. <laughs>